of Fiona Brown and I, I'd like to welcome you to the second in the series of webinars that we're putting on for 2021, uh, which are meant to occur in the lunch hour. Our intent with these webinars is to touch on various topics of all kinds of different practice areas, uh, including topics that are, are timely, like the one we're going to discuss today. Uh, so just a little bit about our firm, for those of you who may not know, SBA is a uh, civil uh, defense insurance litigation firm of 16 lawyers. Uh, we're led by uh, a female majority partnership, which I thought I'd mention in honor of the upcoming International Women's Day next week. Uh, and we have three offices, one in Toronto, one in Waterloo, and one in London. We practice in a wide array of areas, including tort bodily injury claims, CGL, occupier's liability, uh, auto accidents, accident benefits, priority and loss transfer, coverage, and cyber liability, just to name a few. Uh, so Fiona and I are from the Toronto office, the current, uh, one of the current lockdown uh, capitals of Ontario. And we're here to, today to talk to you about the recent amendments to the Occupier's Liability Act. And these amendments were put into effect um, fairly recently and, and they make quite a significant change with respect to the notice requirements to be given uh, in claims involving snow and ice. Um, so just before we get into our topic, I have a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to mention. Uh, we've muted all the lines so that uh, there's no distraction amongst the attendees. So we can't hear you and we can't see you. So please feel free to enjoy your lunch. We're not going to see if you're having a bad hair day or spinach in your teeth. Uh, so we hope you relax and uh, enjoy. And there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. So you'll see a Q&A button on your screen. So feel free to enter any questions in there and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can by the end. And we also have a poll included in our presentation, which we would encourage you to uh, answer when it comes up. And uh, with that, let's turn to the roadmap of where we are going here today. So first we're gonna touch on the background of Bill 118 and the new notice requirements. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is a reasonable excuse and prejudice to the defendant in terms of how you can get out of having to give the notice requirement. And what does this amendment mean moving forward? Fiona is going to take over at that point and talk to you about that, as well as the applicable time periods that we have to be mindful of and a to-do list for insurers and risk managers going forward. So without further ado, let's get started on the first slide here. So in terms of the background of Bill 118, before this amendment, there was no dedicated requirement for written notice uh, within a certain time frame applicable to uh, occupiers and independent contractors in slip and fall claims relating to snow and ice. The plaintiff just had to issue the claim by the two-year limitation deadline. But then snow remover, uh, removal operators started to voice some significant concerns uh, over considerable surges in insurance costs and premiums following a bump in slip and fall claims made against them. So according to the Insurance Brokers Association of Ontario, the increases in slip and fall claims against snow removal companies led some insurers to limit the availability of insurance coverage to contractors. So this meant that snow removal operators would not be able to secure the necessary liability um, insurance and therefore would just be unable to operate. So in response, Bill 118 was proposed to address these concerns by significantly shortening the time limit to give notice of a slip and fall claim to occupiers and snow removal contractors. It was initially recommended that instead of allowing for this two year limitation period to bring a claim, that there be a 10 day notice period, which is the same as we see for municipal uh, entities in um, various legislation. So this was tabled by Perry Sound Muskoka MPP Norm Miller and because the proposed 10 day period was considered by critics of the original bill to be too short, um, it was ultimately agreed by the, by the government as a, as a whole that the requisite notice period would be 60 days following the slip and fall incident. So Bill 118 was initially acted, enacted as chapter 33 of the statutes of Ontario, but now it should be cited as the Occupier's Liability Amendment Act 2020. And interestingly, this bill was passed when it received royal assent on December 8th, 2020, which just so happened to be the day before heavy, wet snow and slush landed in most parts of southern Ontario. So I'm not sure how they planned that so well, but it worked out. So after a proclamation by the Lieutenant Governor, 
this act officially came into effect on January 29, 2021. So that's the key date that you want to remember for that. So now I want to get into the actual requirements under the amendments. Uh, so once again, this bill amends the Occupier's Liability Act in relation to personal injury claims relating to snow and ice. Uh, so in uh, going forward now, the plaintiff is barred from bringing an action in these types of claims unless they give notice within 60 days after the occurrence of the injury to at least one occupier or independent contractor employed by the occupier to remove snow and ice on the premises. It has to be in writing. It has to include the date, the time, and the location of the occurrence. And it has to be delivered by personal service or sent by registered mail to at least one of the occupier or the independent contractor. So occupier in this context, from what we know of the surrounding legislation is a person who's in physical possession of the premises, a person who has responsibility for and control over the condition of the premises uh, or the activities carried on the premises uh, and controls uh, persons or people who are allowed to enter the premises. So it can include homeowners, business owners, landlords, potential tenants, uh, all kinds of different entities. And then of course the independent contractor means the contractor employed by the occupier to remove snow or ice on the premises during the relevant period. Uh, so Fiona's gonna talk about this a little bit further later on, but to be clear, the two year limitation still applies to bring a claim, but the notice amendment operates as a bar if the appropriate notice wasn't given uh, as the legislative amendments require. So in terms of the copy of the notice, it has to, Essentially, if, if an occupier receives the notice, they have to send that notice to any other occupier of the premises and an independent contractor that they employ to remove the snow and the ice. Uh, and again, that also has to be done by personal service or registered mail. And similarly, the independent contractor, if they're the one who gets the notice, then they have to give the notice, a copy of the notice rather, to the occupier that employed them. Um, so you can kind of see there's a bit of a less um, of an obligation on the contractor than on the occupier because uh, they have to give it to basically everybody involved versus the independent contractor. Uh, but you'll note that there is no actual time requirement by which the occupier or the independent contractor have to give that notice. Um, you know, obviously though, we can certainly foresee there could be a potential defense on, uh, on the behalf of any parties who didn't originally receive that first notice if there was a particularly lengthy delay or those parties uh, you know, lost investigation opportunities due to a lack of, of timely notice. But then there's a couple of important exceptions that we need to be mindful of for situations where the notice either wasn't given or it wasn't sufficient. So one of those exceptions is if the person who was injured ultimately dies as a result of the injury. Clearly they couldn't give notice, that's a given. The prob probably the more interesting exception is if the plaintiff um, basically has to bring a, a motion or app uh, or somewhat of that nature to a judge and the judge finds that there's a reasonable excuse for why the notice either wasn't given or it wasn't given uh, properly and the defendant is not prejudiced in its defense. If both of those requirements are met as, as found to be determined by a judge, then the notice requirement is not a bar to the litigation. So I'll talk about that a little bit more, but just to uh, go through the requirements, uh, there's this additional section that basically says, you know, for greater certainty, so long as the plaintiff gave written notice containing the key elements to at least one occupier uh, or one independent contractor employed by the occupier, then the plaintiff isn't barred from bringing that court action uh, after the 60 day initial period. Uh, obviously subject to the usual two-year limitation period. Um, so for example, if the plaintiff gives written notice to the occupier of the premises, but not to the independent contractor or any other occupier, that doesn't stop the plaintiff from issuing a statement of claim against any potential at-fault defendant in the future. Uh, again, so long as they meet all of the other limitation requirements. Um, so that's true even if not all of the defendants receive that initial notice. Okay, so I just want to get into reasonable excuse. Um, so basically, the interesting part here is the onus is actually on the plaintiff to show that 
um, they've essentially had this reasonable excuse for not fulfilling the notice requirements uh, and that the defendant didn't suffer prejudice in its defense of the claim because of the improper notice or lack of notice. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about what a reasonable excuse is and what that likely means. But before we do that, I'm going to introduce our poll of the webinar. Um, so you can see here, which of the following amounts to a reasonable excuse for failing to give the required notice? And I want you to click on each one that you think applies. There's four options there. Just give everybody a minute. I know they're a little lengthy. Okay, just give it another uh, few seconds here, give people a chance to have a look at that. I think we're wrapping up on the poll. And hopefully you can see the results on the screen there. Um, just run through them. Uh, so the answers, plaintiff lacked awareness of the notice requirement, 35%. Sorry, no, I tricked you. Um, that is not a valid excuse. We'll go through that in the case law. Um, the second, that the plaintiff lacked awareness of the severity of the plaintiff's injury. Yes, 49% of you got that right. Uh, number three, slip and fall was an unforeseeable event outside the plaintiff's control. Sorry, no, not a valid excuse. That's not, uh, not going to fly. And lastly, I'm actually impressed that uh, the number of you, 74% got this right, which is a bit of a tricky one, that the plaintiff had significant personal circumstances which consumed a lot of the plaintiff's attention after the fall. So congratulations, you surprised me there. I was surprised. Um, so I'm going to throw you to uh, the next slide here, which is basically showing um, what will pass as a reasonable excuse and what won't. And obviously, there's no case law on this yet. This amendment just went into effect. But uh, we think we can glean from the case law that interprets this type of statutory language in um, the Municipal Act 2001 and the City of Toronto Act, because they have very similar terms on what a reasonable excuse is. Um, so you'll see some references in those slides to the, the various cases that touch on this. Um, but obviously in terms of the yes column, lack or delay of knowledge of the severity of the plaintiff's injury, that was really solidified by the Ontario Court of Appeal in the Crinson and City of Toronto case. Uh, the plaintiff in that case suffered a serious injury requiring a lengthy period of rehab, which affected his mental state as well and made, meant that he couldn't turn his attention to giving notice at the time. Uh, so that was found to be a reasonable excuse. And uh, the personal life circumstances one, the interesting um, fact scenario uh, or example that was given in CIF and City of Toronto, Justice Hoy made it clear that uh, one example of what a reasonable excuse would be, would be, let's say, a situation involving a plaintiff who slips and falls um, on a premises, and they have a child that's got some terminal illness, and they're going through a lengthy course of treatment. That's, you know, it's not the parent's injury that creates the reasonable excuse, but it's the, the child situation that consumes the parent's attention that they wouldn't have uh, turned their mind to a notice. So that, that will fly. Uh, and then of course on the no column, uh, ignorance of statutory time limits, no huge surprise probably that uh, that's not going to con constitute a reasonable excuse on its own. Uh, delay in seeking legal advice in uh, Hen and City of Brampton, the plaintiff had knee surgery within months of the fall, but it should have been apparent by about the five month mark that he had a claim for damages. Uh, even though he apparently didn't know of the requirement to give notice, he didn't seek legal advice for over a year. So the judge said, no, that's not a reasonable excuse. And then uh, finally in argue and Tay, the Ontario Court of Appeal agreed with the plaintiff that uh, she knew she'd been injured, um, but at the same time, she was physically and mentally capable of being able to notify the defendant township of the accident. So uh, at, that, at the end of the day, that was not a reasonable excuse. So you can see it's a pretty factual analysis. Uh, and similarly, just um, on prejudice to the defendant, uh, it's important to know there, uh, in addition to the onus requirement on the plaintiff, that it's not how much prejudice a defendant has suffered, it's whether. So it's a pretty clear test in that, in that sense. Um, so some factors to consider as to whether there is prejudice to the defendant. We're talking about the length of the delay leading to the prejudice, such as inadvertent destruction of evidence, 
uh, lack of opportunity to obtain evidence that might have otherwise been available to the defendant had they gotten notice, investigating potential witnesses, um, and in that sense, you know, in the lack of opportunity to investigate, there may be uh, conditions at the time that they wanted to investigate, but they couldn't because of the notice. Too much time has passed, records are purged because of company retention policies, uh, and then of course, poor witness recall. If a defendant could have interviewed somebody within two months of the fall, uh, surely that's going to trigger uh, a more reliable memory, I would say, than if they wait until the two-year limitation to issue the claim. Or worse yet, a, a material witness just couldn't be identified because of the time that had passed. Um, so a couple of ways that the, the plaintiff might actually meet that onus of prejudice is if the defendant took steps to investigate in, in spite of not receiving the notice, uh, photographs were taken at the accident scene, uh, and also they were able to identify witnesses, which ultimately um, gave evidence or, or some sort of um, recollection of the event. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Fiona to discuss what does this all mean going forward? Thank you, Krista. And good afternoon, everyone. Are you really out there? I, I, I can't see you. So I, I guess I have to assume you're all out there. Thank you so much for coming. Um, prior to uh, the enactment of Section 6.1 of uh, this new act, there was no notice requirement under the Occupier's Liability Act. Claimants only had to adhere to the Limitations Act and uh, file their statement of claim within two years of the date they knew or ought to have known they had a potential cause of action against the at-fault party. Now, with only that two-year period applying to slip and fall cases, as I'm sure most of you uh, saw claims, sorry, um, cl uh, occupiers were not getting notice of claims until almost two years had passed. This gave plaintiffs a considerable advantage at collecting evidence. Uh, this new act, however, I, I will assist uh, in particular snow removal contractors to defend claims as they're now going to get notice much earlier uh, and will have time to collect their records and their memories will not be hazy. Um, it'll make defending claims, I believe, much easier. Um, the new requirement will also allow insurers and risk managers better access to timely evidence, such as locating potential, locating potential witnesses, getting statements from witnesses, uh, preserving CCTV footage. People's memories will be much better after uh, 60 days as opposed to 730 days. Uh, Bill 198, although does uh, set out some significant changes, does not uh, change the occupier's obligations under the Occupier's Liability Act. Their obligation remains to ensure that premises are kept reasonably safe in the circumstances. Um, and Krista uh, touched on this, that um, the act does raise a potential issue. As she advised us, um, um, an occupier must, uh, on receipt of notice, either serve by personal service or by reg registered mail, notice on other potential occupiers. However, the subsections uh, that create these obligations are silent on to, as to the time period within, what, within which this notice must be given. And the sections are also silent on the consequences of failing to deliver that notice. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out in the future. I anticipate it's going to boil down to whether or not the party who did not receive notice was prejudiced in any way. Um, I see the likely effects of this notice requirement as twofold. I think first, we may see a reduction in claims because people will, will just not know about this new notice requirement and the notice period will be missed. Or on the other hand, every injured person will rush out to uh, prematurely to issue claims in, in anticipation of missing that time period. So those are two possible scenarios I think we'll see in the future. Prior to the 60 day notice um, requirement, the injured person normally had a particularized claim by the time they issued their claim because they had two years to collect 
uh, information in support of their injuries. In contrast, the new 60-day period will likely create more contested litigation where an insurer or a risk manager will now have to address a laundry list of potential uh, claims that are unspecified. The result of this will be more contested litigation. This lack, lack of crystallized damages may extend the time it will take to settle claims. Often, as you all know, by the time the statement of claim is issued and served, the injured person has two years worth of evidence in support of their damages. So settlement can often occur fairly early maybe after the examination for discovery or even before that. With the 60 day notice requirement, an injured person is likely um, to not have collected the necessary information to get a file settled, such as doctor's records, employment information, OHIP subrogated claim, and uh, the incurred expenses for treatment. As Krista pointed out, we now have three applicable time periods to uh, re remember when it comes to slip and falls on ice. We have the Municipal Act that requires 10 days notice after a fall. We have the Occupier's Liability Amendment Act, which requires 60, notice within 60 days of a fall. And lastly, of course, the Limitations um, Act that requires a party to issue their claim within two years after they knew or ought to have known they had a claim against the at-fault party. So what should insurers and risk managers be doing now that this new act is in force? First, I think you should notify um, any of your insurers who are occupiers, let them know about this new act, the notice requirement, and let them know as soon as they receive notice, they should send that to you. You may want to have a standard notice letter that you send on behalf of your insureds to the occupier or snow removal contract on behalf of your insured. Secondly, I think this would be a very good time to remind your insureds to keep detailed records of the activities they're carrying out on the premises they're involved in. Remind them, include the time um, they were at the premises, the date, what activities were carried out, where the activities were carried out. If salt was applied, how much salt was applied. Secondly, it's a good time to remind them to review their uh, snow and ice removal contract, in particular with respect to the scope of work. What I see at examinations for discovery is a contractor or owner of property being taken through the contract, paragraph by paragraph. Oftentimes there's inconsistencies this only gives plaintiff's counsel ammunition to lead evidence that there was not a reasonable system in place when the fall occurred. Case law is clear. Not only must there be a reasonable system, such as a detailed contract, but the system must be working on the date of loss. I think um, this is also a good opportunity to remind your insured um, to maintain CCTV footage and perhaps make sure it's not overwritten or re-recorded within 60 days, as opposed to the few days that I normally see. It's a good opportunity to also ask your insured not to delete the CCTV footage, even if it doesn't show the fall. Having evidence of the weather that day, the condition of the property, whether salt can be seen on other parts of the property, is very useful evidence. In conclusion, uh, this new act does represent a significant change. People at first may rush out and the number of claims may be increased. In the long term, however, I think this is going to reduce the number of claims as some people will miss the limitation period. More importantly, defendants will now have access to the evidence needed to defend their claim. Thank you. Great, thank you for that, Fiona. That was uh, very insightful, lots to to squeeze into a webinar, we realize, but uh, we're trying our best with the hour we have. Um, I just want to put a reminder to everybody again: if you have any questions at all, please don't be shy. Throw them into the Q and A, and uh, we can address those. I see I have a couple that have come in here. Um, looks like one was actually already answered about the time limit for the occupier independent contractor to provide notice. So thanks, Fiona, for already covering that one. 
Uh, another question is, what does personal service mean in this context of giving notice to the occupier or the independent contractor? Um, and in particular, during COVID, when a lot of these property management offices are closed, um, you know, what does that mean? Can somebody avoid personal service uh, or, or registered mail? Fiona, maybe I'll get you to touch on that. Oh, uh, sure. Um, I mean, definitely uh, more people are working from home, but I think it would be unreasonable uh, to uh, suggest that because of COVID offices are being closed completely, mail is not being picked up, telephones are not being answered. So I think um, if a, um, a letter is delivered by registered mail and left at the premises, it's reasonable to assume eventually it would be picked up, but um, perhaps to be safer, you could also send a courier, same thing, leave it at the premises. And I think a court would find that so long as it was delivered in that fashion, I think that would constitute service. No, I, I completely agree. I think it's, uh, you know, that whole no take backs rule, uh, you know, you throw something at somebody in person for personal service uh, and these alternative methods, they're going to end up flying if, if previous case law is any indication of that. Um, so that makes sense. And uh, another very interesting question, uh, because this is specifically to do with snow and ice type claims or claims that arise from snow and ice, the question is, would this amendment apply to a situation where you have melted snow that has come from outside into a re retail location indoors? What do you think about that? Uh, it, I, I think the question is if, if snow or water was being tracked outside, inside from people going in and out, I would say that is more a janitorial issue. Um, it, one can, we can't expect a snow removal contractor to go in and um, clean the interior entranceway of a building. So I think that would be a janitorial issue as opposed to a snow and ice type of claim and would fall out of the uh, notice requirement. I, and I tend to agree, just I think, you know, based on the wording of this act, a court is most likely taking a literal meaning or middle, literal interpretation of that, that word snow and ice in a, in a different form, or even if snow happened to be tracked in, I just, it doesn't seem to, uh, you know, at least the janitorial company would have to come in anyway. That's, that's And you know, what's, what's interesting, Krista, is that we might see um, in an abundance of caution, claimants might still serve notice just to be sure. So I, I think risk managers and insurers, insurance adjusters should be on the lookout for that as well, that ensure that it is a snow and ice situation as opposed to a janitorial situation. Definitely, I agree. And I've actually had a couple of questions about uh, whether our, our PowerPoint presentation can be available. Absolutely, we're happy to, to send it to anybody who wants a copy. Just reach out to uh, Fiona or I and we can, we can send that out, no problem at all. Um, we're happy to do that. And uh, I mean, it's a pretty short act, but we can we can include the wording of that um, as well if you need. Um, so we're already at 1259. I can't believe that uh, our time has flown by. So it wouldn't be a lunch and learn if I didn't at least show you a picture of lunch. Um, you know, we obviously like to do something like this together, but this is uh, the times we're in right now. So, so here we are. Uh, so again, we're happy to circulate a copy of the PowerPoint, even with our uh, silly little uh, slides. Uh, but I, just before we sign off, I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware and keep you in the loop about our next uh, couple of lunch and learns that we have. Uh, we're trying to do, do this roughly every three weeks or so with, uh, like I said, various topics. So the next one coming up is uh, for any uh, anyone who delves into the accident benefits world or knows somebody who does. Uh, and that's the MIG case law update uh, on how the lab is treating psych chronic pain and concussions. And that's on March 25th at 12.30. And then next up, uh, we have another tort topic, and that is on how to assess housekeeping damages claims. Um, you may uh, think it's pretty straightforward, but there might be a little bit more to it than, uh, than you think. Um, so we're happy to talk about that on April the 14th. Um, so we hope to see you at our next uh, webinar. And on behalf of Fiona and myself and everyone at SBA, thank you again for joining. We really appreciate your time. Thank you.